Aloha. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. Welcome to What Now America. I'm Tim Apatel, your host. Uh, today's title is Senate Passes $1 trillion Infrastructure Bill. You know, when I talk to friends, you know, we talk about budgets and the concern for deficit spending and all that good stuff. And I say, do you know how much a billion dollars is? And I kind of get that, that stare, that faraway look, uh, the deer in the headlights look, if you will. Um, and then the guesses range from 10 million to 100 million. I go, no, 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 no. It's 1,000 million equals a billion. So how many million does, e does it equal 1 trillion? Well, that looks gets worse. It's more than a stare off in the distance. There is this confusion and, and a bunch of mumbling that comes from my friend's mouth. Well, it's one million million that equals one trillion dollars. So uh, the Senate, to its credit, it was a vote of 69 to 30, passed a one trillion dollar or 100 million, no, one, <laughs> yeah, even I've done it, one million million uh, budget proposal for the House to take up when they come back from recess on August 23rd. Now, Nancy Pelosi said that she's not going to entertain it unless the, uh, the Senate passes or it makes the first initial step towards passing the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill. I call it the social infra infrastructure bill because it, it, it deals with human infrastructure. And uh, lo and behold, that was done at four o'clock in the morning, Eastern time, uh, this on Wednesday, today. So there's the green light for Nancy Pelosi to start working on gathering her consensus from all Democrats, be it progressive or not, uh, to pass the one trillion dollar infrastructure bill. So before I move on with uh, our guests, I'd like to introduce Jay Fidel. Uh, Jay, it's old times again. Just you and you and me. Yeah, uh, it feels great. It feels like a trillion dollars or a million million. There, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, before I go to my first question, let me just run down the goodies of this one trillion dollar uh, infrastructure bill. Um, one hundred ten billion for roads and bridges. 15 billion for electric vehicles, 11 billion for road safety, 66 billion for passenger and freight rail, 65 billion for broadband, 17 billion for ports and waterways, 65 billion for clean water efforts, uh, I think particularly getting the lead pipes out of the, some of the Midwest states, 73 billion for the electric grid, 50 billion for water uh, storage, Western water storage, 39 billion for public transit, 25 billion for airports. And guess what? Mitch McConnell voted for this. Are you amazed? Are you, are you surprised? Because I think in previous discussions, I, I think both of us were somewhat dubious on the fact that this would even go get through the Senate uh, without having to um, mess with the filibuster. Are you surprised? Yes. I don't know if you saw uh, Rachel Maddow last night. She's surprised too. She said, you know, I was dead wrong. I thought they would never pass it, and they passed it. That is really, really interesting. But then, you know, uh, uh, is Congress going to do the $3.5 trillion? And that's the big question, one way or the other, because they're linked. They're linked um, in the House, and they're linked on Biden's desk. They're linked. No, but are they? Are they? I think what Nancy Pelosi said is she wouldn't support the $1 trillion unless they made the first. Remember, the budget reconciliation can take months and months, uh, whereas she just said they needed to get the first step on that budget reconciliation process, which occurred at 4 o'clock in the morning today. So are they linked? We'll see. You're asking me to be optimistic. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, Rachel, Rachel is not <laughs> like old time optimistic <laughs> about the second shoe dropping here, and I'm, I'm not optimistic about it either. And you ask me, and this is really an important question, why did Mitch McConnell vote for this? Why did his boys all come around for this in the Senate? Um, and, and, I, and I think it's not simple. It's not because they felt, oh, what a great Democratic idea this one is. That's not how they felt. Remember, he swore to oppose everything Biden did, everything uh, Nancy Pelosi did. Mm -hmm. So what happened? What's new? What is his logic, his reasoning? What is his motivation? You know, he's got to have a motivation. It's got to be self-serving in some way. There's no other way to look at it. So I'm thinking, thinking, banging my head on the wall, thinking, why did he do this? And, you know, we can only speculate, but the guy is really smart and really strategic. 
So one thing is, you know, it's all gravy, right? It's all earmarked kind of money for different locations. And that's why they were able to negotiate it as a, a, a bipartisan bill, because everybody gets something. That list of, um, you know, infrastructure that you read off is really a, a, a list of Christmas gifts um, to everyone in every state, including especially the Republican red states and Mitch McConnell's state. Um, there's going to be mm, all this infrastructure coming in, all these jobs coming in, all this money. Um, the country will, especially the Republicans, will be awash in money. So that's one reason. The other reason is let us let us not diminish the possibility of another McConnell fake out. He's faked out the Democrats how many times already? Take them down a path and then change course um, and, and let them swing. You know, and public opinion is so important. So now that they voted for it, okay, the public wants it. Everybody wants it. Um, and if um, Nancy or Joe Biden um, refuse to do it because of troubles on the $3.5 trillion bill, um, they, the Democrats, will be very, very unpopular. This has got momentum all by itself is what I'm telling you. And the, the, the very strange arrangement that Biden fashioned um, about linking the two may not stand because now we're on the track, uh, literally, uh, with the infrastructure on the one trillion bill. So yeah. watch this space, Tim. It ain't simple. Well, you know, Joan Manson, no sooner did that three point five trillion dollar uh, vote, they called it the Votorama. Uh, no sooner did that get the first to first base that Joe Manson came out. And here's a quote from Joe Manson. Uh, serious concerns about the grave consequences facing West Virginians and every American family if Congress decides to spend another $3.5 trillion. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is the art and of the game. Don't surprise me. <clears throat> uh, Kristen Sinema uh, went along with him on that. I'm, I'm going to faint if you tell me she didn't. Well, couldn't have passed without her. <laughs> right? It couldn't have passed. But, you know, she said there's no way that she's going to support a $3.5 trillion. Um, she just says, there's no way I'm going to support that. So, I mean, and, and I think a lot of Democrats have to agree. That's a lot of money. I mean, uh, just alone on the $1 trillion, there's an estimated $248 billion that will be immediately added to the federal deficit because it's, it's not offset with funding. And in the $1 trillion package, they didn't get any tax increases against the wealthy. Remember, uh, originally Joe Biden wanted to have a, I believe it was a a higher tax bracket for those making over four hundred thousand dollars a year. That didn't go anywhere. Right. So on the one trillion, we have you're going to have a potential four hundred two hundred forty eight dollar billion add on immediately. Um, yeah, there's concerns from all Democrats, I think, about the three point five trillion. And to be honest with you, I'm one of them. Okay, well, you know, and and that makes sense in terms of public opinion. Uh, my, my theory, as we will see, is that uh, the 3.5 stalls and Nancy and Joe can't figure a way to, you know, link them up to the point where he gets both of his bills. And then there's going to be tremendous, there is already tremendous pressure uh, for the, you know, the, the $1 trillion bill, which the Republicans love. You think about it. All, all the stuff that Democrats love is in the 3.5 bill. All the stuff the Republicans love is in the one point trillion bill. Um, the Republicans are going to get theirs and the Democrats are not going to get theirs. That's my I'm sticking with it, too. We can make a side bet if you like them. No, I, I, I think the one trillion on day two, when Congress um, comes back from recess on day two, it's passed. And on day three, it's in front of Joe Biden for signature. Right. So is he not going to sign it? Of course, he's going to sign it, but that's one trillion. Uh, you know, there's a two and a half trillion dollar de uh, delta between the one trillion and the three and a half trillion. There's no way three point five trillion is going to get approved. I'll put I'll go put good money and a steak dinner on that one. OK, we got two bets going then. You know, at the end of the day, the Republicans get the bill that they want, that they agreed to. That's going to you know, lay a lot of money into their states. Uh, and have none of the democratic idealistic, um, you know, provisions. Um, to none of them, uh, and and the, the Democrats will not get their three point five. How sad that is! How very sad. And I don't I don't care about the money. I mean, the economists are telling us it will be okay 
if we spend that much. But the larger question is this. Um, this country is in, is in uh, distress. It's in a kind of a continuing emergency. It's not just COVID, although it's the effects of COVID on the economy. We really have to change things. There has to be a transformation if we are to survive. That transformation is not happening. I agree that 3.5 has very little chance of passing. Um, and as a result, you know, um, I, the transformation economically um, is not as likely to happen. And then you have voting rights, and then you have gun control, and then you have immigration reform. I could go on. None of those things, ready, Tim, are going to happen. It astounds me um, that, that we have not been able to uh, repeal or even modify um, the uh, filibuster. But that's not going to happen either, because, because um, your friend Manchin is going to stop it. Well, Man but, Manchin didn't say he wouldn't uh, look at, in fact, I heard him numerous times uh, saying he would look into reform of the filibuster, but not the, re the abolishment, to abolish the filibuster. So there's a vast difference between the two. Well, maybe a vast difference technically, but I just don't think it's going to happen. And uh, he's made it clear that he, you know, questions all of that, and cinema will come along with him on it, and they, they won't be able to mount the votes necessary to do anything. Bottom line, bottom line is that Manchin has been holding all this up now for eight months. Um, I suspect that he is really a Republican in disguise. I suspect this is all a sham on Congress and the American people. Uh, and Manchin is on the side of letting the country slide into oblivion. Um, that, but that's just me. Well, I'd like to take that up because, you know, um, not long ago, Lindsey Graham came down with COVID. And how did he come up with COVID? He was on a boat, a party um, sponsored by Joe Manchin. And see, a lot of people said, well, see, there's proof. Joe Manchin really isn't a Republican. And I look at it completely different. I'm going, thank God. Joe Manchin is inviting people from all sides of the aisle to party on, party on on the high seas because that's how things get done. In Congress, in the old days, uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill would go out every Friday night and have a, a whiskey or two. I mean, you, you can't get along with people until you understand who they are. And you can't, you can't negotiate deals unless you don't trust them. And how do you trust people? Um, you go out and have a couple cocktails. You get to know them, you get to know about their families, you get to know about, you know, they're, they're thinking about things that are completely unrelated to politics. And, and, and something strange might happen. You might get to like them. And if you get to like them, you might form a relationship. And if you form a relationship, you might form some sort of bond that says, let's do some horse trading. It's called making compromises in the, in the Congress, Senate and the House. What a great thing. I was elated to hear that Joe Manchin invited Republicans on his boat. And, and that's how things used to get done. Silence. <laughs> Silence. Silence. I don't know how to frame this. Uh, so it I'll wasn't a question. It, I'll try it to say a question. it in Hungary, and you, you need to take the needle out of your arm, actually. Tim. <laughs> even okay. assuming all of that is true, even assuming that, you know, Manchin is, uh, is he's sincere, um, and he wants to make friends, and through friends, you can have bilateral. The fact is, he's opposed all the steps necessary uh, to adopt Biden's most important, uh, you know, initiatives. And um, bottom line is, uh, he's standing in the way, just him. And, and Biden cannot reach him. Is he not friendly with Biden? What's happening here? You know, bottom line is, uh, he's, he's opposed it all. And because he's opposed it all, None of Biden's major initiatives have gotten through, and we're all hanging, waiting. And okay, well, the metronome ticks every day. I agree. That is, that's a good point. Let's look at another optic, though. You had 19 Republican senators vote in favor of the $1 trillion infrastructure bill. Um, what does that say to Donald Trump and the fact that his, his faithful lackey, uh, Mitch McConnell, supported it, voted for it? Uh, Donald Trump, you know, was adamant about not uh, having the GOP vote for it. What's that say? What were the optics on that in your mind? Well, let's, let's look at McConnell, because he still has a lot of power in the Senate, doesn't he? 
it's not this is not a breakaway kind of thing nobody nobody among those 19 has they voted that way yes uh, but nobody has said i'm i'm disagreeing with trump i'm out of the camp here i'm changing my my party or my mm, affiliation with trump um so you know to me this could easily be part of a a grand strategy that McConnell is orchestrating, where we will find out, as I said before, that the, the Republican bilateral bill, in quotes, passes and the Democratic bill doesn't pass, and Biden cannot link them together. Um, so it's okay, because um, all these Republican uh, senators are going to get big bucks out of it. So I'm not, I'm not you know, convinced that uh, it's, it's a bad thing for the Republicans. Uh, and I'm not convinced that that um, McConnell isn't on um, a grand strategy here uh, to uh, ultimately embarrass Biden. If Biden holds up on signing the one billion dollar, uh, one trillion dollar bill, he's going to look terrible. And um, McConnell will attack him till the cows come home. They will attack every Democrat till the cows come home. It'd be a, a grand loss for the Democrats who engineered the bill in the first place. Uh, which, which is very ironic. As for um, you know, why is it 19 and, and not uh, more than 19? It was like enough, but not n much more than enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I suggest that's part of a strategy. Uh, I, I guess in order to answer the question, I would want to go down a matrix of exactly who it was and how faithful and loyal they've been to McConnell and Trump in the past. Um, and I'm the jury's out until we can do that because um, it's nobody among the 19, not even McConnell, has said I'm doing this because I'm I'm abandoning Trump. Nobody has said that. Correct. Right. Okay. Well, you know, Donald Trump has entered the conversation, so let's um, let's switch gears and kind of continue uh, in the Trump vein here. And that is um, the recent reports that the DOJ, the Department of Justice was pressured extensively by Donald Trump and asking them to call out the 2020 election as corrupt. And I don't have the exact quote, but he basically said, just call it corrupt and I'll take care of the rest. Me and the other, G uh, the other R's, meaning the other Republicans. Wow. I mean, that, and then of course, um, we had, I think seven hours of testimony from the former acting as attorney general, basically agreeing that yes, that's what Donald Trump was putting pressure on us to do. And um, does that close the loop, if you will? Does that close the, the evidence loop of Donald Trump? You will remember he asked the um, Secretary of State of Georgia to find 11,780 votes. And of course, all the lawsuits, the frivolous lawsuits of you know, declaring the election fraud and Giuliani um, putting out you know, the, um, the election machines, the Dominion election machines were switched. And now he's put, you know, the evidence is coming to light that he put on direct pressure to the DOJ. Does that show him culpable of trying to throw a democratic election? And, and the second part of that question is, does that help someone in the future to file a suit against Donald Trump on the 14th Amendment, paragraph three, to prevent him from ever attaining public office again for his role in trying to overthrow a democratic election? Well, I think there are a number of a number of uh, points on which um, that suit could be based, not just this. Uh, my, my reaction is good for the, the committee. I, I, for a while, I told you, I thought the committee was you know, going to go underground and be distracted by other shiny objects, uh, shiny ob objects like the infrastructure bill uh, or bills, as the case may be. Um, but this means the committee is working. This, this means the committee has uh, hit pay dirt on at least some witnesses, and it's finding out what happened in the Department of Justice. <clears throat> sure, it shows that Trump did what we all know he did. He, he took every opportunity, <clears throat> every strategy, every wild maneuver um, to try to retain power. We, we know that. And some of, some of those things have come out. I think there's even more to come. Um, the, you know, the problem is, what does the public think? I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of a member of the base, and I'm not sure what the member of the base would would say. Oh, this is all paperwork. Um, you know, this is the, he, he's entitled to try to stay in power. He's entitled to try to manipulate the Department of Justice. They're his lawyers. You know, buying into the buying into the Trump's general position. 
So in terms of public opinion, I'm not sure it's all that big a deal. Uh, in terms of um, the commission's report, it is a big deal. Uh, I think it leads to other similar things. You know, we know now that he was doing everything he could possibly do. Uh, and, and you and I can also connect the dots and, and assume that he was doing other things and that the committee is looking into that. So kudos to them for finding these witnesses. Kudos to them for discovering this plan, this, this um, what do you want to call it? Treason. Treason is what it is. I don't know why they don't use that word. Um, and um, there'll be more. There'll be more and, and good for them. The yeah. question is, at the end of the day, um, we're going to get from this committee a report. Mm-hmm. And what, what's, what it all will fall on Merrick Garland, the Department of Justice, to do something or not. And he, in my opinion, has been a wall, a nice yeah. man, a wonderful jurist, a great judge. But Attorney General, I'm not so sure. Um, it's going to fall on him to either prosecute or not. Um, and the jury's out on that one. Well, too. what if, what if? okay, so remember, the Inspector General is doing a parallel investigation. And what if the Inspector General says there are grounds for criminal charges against the former president? Uh, and they they make that a recommendation, rather than the DOJ coming up with this this idea of of filing criminal charges. Uh, would the DOJ act on that? Do you think, if it came from an outside source, so they don't have to embroil themselves in the politics of of trying to prosecute uh, a former president? Same same thing. Going to fall in the Department of Justice to actually prosecute. In this capacity, he's a prosecutor. In this capacity, he has the power. And I don't know if Biden will influence him or try to influence him or not. He has the power to prosecute or not, to impanel a grand jury, to ask a grand jury to you know uh, uh, bring back a, a true bill, and to um, haul that guy into court for criminal prosecution. Uh, right now, we know enough, you and me, to make that decision. Um, <clears throat> does Merrick Garland know enough? What are the considerations he faces? And what are the personal reservations he has about going after a former president? Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure he's going to do anything. And, and the future of um, public confidence in the system, in the Department of Justice, which, by the way, has taken a hit you know, in these revelations, the Department of Justice, what happened to those guys? It wasn't just at the, at the top. It was many, many lawyers and principals of the Department of Justice who were part of Trump's uh, inside team. And so query, you know, what's left of them. OK, well, not that there's a correlation or there should be any correlation between filing criminal charges against uh, Donald Trump uh, versus the reestablishment of credibility for the Department of Justice. But by de facto, it would occur that if the Department of Justice were to file criminal charges, that would put them back in I think pretty good standing as far as our credibility of an independent, uh, technically an independent um, department. That's true. Of our a, government. As a decision. Okay. Correct. But then you have to prosecute. You have to bring your best and brightest in from wherever they are. You have to make a trial team and, and you can't take wooden nickels. Remember that Trump has how many millions to spend to defend on this? He will defend. He's defended thousands of lawsuits before this, including criminal prosecutions. Um, And he is, for the most part, he has succeeded. He gets away with it where poor Andrew Cuomo doesn't. He gets away with everything so far. And And so it's it's a question of how ardent those prosecutors are, how good they are, how determined, how motivated, um, you know, and how they handle the prosecution. Well, all, all departments have, have politics um, embroiled within their, their agencies, and the Department of Justice is no different. I'm not talking about politics. But, I'm talking about competence. I'm well, talking- I mean, but there is the politics, of the optics of politics that says, okay, not all prosecutions are successful. Uh, and, and they were to prosecute Donald Trump. There's no guarantee it would be successful, but it certainly would enhance the credibility of that, of that department. Um, would it not? Oh, well, from where it is now, absolutely, it would enhance that. They need to enhance their credibility because right now, you know, they're tarnished. And well, that's, that's my suggestion. Come off. 
But, That's, you know, the problem, let me g- give you a scenario. Suppose mm-hmm. they do prosecute, however well they prosecute, but Trump defends. And, um, you know, we had an earlier show where I gave you 50, 50 things that he could do, 50 ways he could defend himself and right. leave his lover, so to speak, <laughs> in the genre of uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Um, yes. Suppose he wins. Suppose he is, um, you know, exonerated yet again in that prosecution. What do you think the public will say then? Uh, this man could get away with any crime that he wanted, including shooting someone on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate your comments on this, Jay. Um, it's, a, it's a big development, I think, and I think we'll find out more. I think also that there will be other members of the Department of Justice that will testify without subpoena, and uh, we'll find out more And in the, the, as the, you know, as the uh, egg develops, so to speak. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, but I did want to get your opinion about the United Nations Declaration of Code Red for the planet, planet Earth and the fact that our climate change has now reached a point where we might have passed a tipping point. And, um, you know, it's, low, it's a low item in the news, news cycle, but it's, it's the fate and future of our planet. You're, um, what do you, do you think about the announcement that it's already too late? Uh, in some areas of climate change and, and global warming that we've already surpassed and we're gonna have to just bear the brunt of the uh, negative effects of that, be it wildfires, flooding. What I'm worried about is the, um, the, the cycle in the Atlantic Ocean, um, the <laughs> conveyor belt that, uh, you know, you get too much uh, fresh water melting from Greenland and it, it affects the salinity of the conveyor belt. And that causes all sorts of problems because the conveyor belt or the, the, the currents are slowing down. And you can have all sorts of uh, increased hurricanes and, and, and uh, horrible, horrible winters. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know, up to this point, we look at the wildfires and the extreme weather and all that. And say, okay, well, so it's a bad storm or it's a wildfire. We can deal with a wildfire. And, you know, so bad weather might, you know, destroy some cities here and there, but we can recover from that. But your point about the, um, quote, conveyor belt in the Atlantic and other, um, you know, biochemical reactions in the oceans and in the atmosphere and on land are already well underway. And they may not be so quickly reversible. They may not be reversible at all. This is the biggest story of our lifetime. All the other things are second to this. And for reasons that are not clear, uh, the United Nations hasn't done much with it, sorry. COP hasn't done much with it, sorry. Trump put it down the wrong way. Biden has his heart in the right place, but he's been distracted by so many other things. Um, Bottom line is the planet is failing. And as the planet fails, humanity will fail. And the the upshot of that will be millions, even billions of people will die before the planet is able to resurrect itself. If an animal goes extinct, which has been happening, because of you know what what we do to the wild, um, it doesn't come back, and there are many things that are happening um, which won't come back. They're irreversible, and our world will be different and dangerous. It will not support as much humanity as it did before. We're in terrible shape here, and it's remarkable that you know there isn't a coming together all around the world. Not just a report by the UN. This is not a surprise. Every scientist can tell you this. Um, you know, we are, we are uh, making a movie. We have made a movie in Think Tech, as you know, uh, dealing with the convergence of climate change and COVID. Um, that's just one element, one convergence. There's so many things are happening that threaten us. And so this is not a surprise, but it should be. It should have been. <laughs> it should have been a surprise Were you, um, at all a while started- ago. <laughs> it should have been, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember um, Al Gore on the ladder showing the, the rise in carbon in the atmosphere and uh, global temperature changes back in 2000, 21 years ago. Yikes. Um, were you surprised at all that uh, the car manufacturing companies in the United States, both Ford and GM, are more or less committed to having uh, zero emission vehicles by the end of uh, this decade? It's nice to see them do that. <clears throat> Is that too late? Nice to Is that still buy- too late? 
it is too late. And why didn't the government do this a long time ago? How hard would it be? You know, this was a, a, a part of a, a political process uh, and not a, and a business process on behalf of the cars. The car manufacturers think that the public wants to see this. So they're responding to the public. They're not doing it for love of love of humanity. I tell you that now. Um, and you know the, the problem is that we 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 look to government to protect us. We look to governments and the United Nations to protect the world against a global threat like this. And we haven't gotten that. This is a great biblical test of humanity in general. And so far, we have failed. All right, you get the last word on that. Um... Any last comments you'd like to make before uh, we conclude our show? I'm so sorry about Afghanistan. You you mentioned that as a possible uh, point of discussion here today. I'm so sorry we couldn't have found a way to at least uh, you know retain a presence there. Um, no, we're not the world's policemen, and no, we don't want to send our troops into harm's way. But if we have, if we are a global leader, um, then we have to do something. What's happening now is that, A, um, you know, people are dying and will die in Afghanistan, and it's terribly unfair. It's brutal. It was worse. It is worse than it was before, actually. So we haven't really helped them over these 20 years. Um, look at it now. It's worse than before we ever arrived. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not particularly uh, sympathetic with the decision that Trump made um, to leave Afghanistan or Biden's follow-up to leave Afghanistan. And I think it's very tragic. In terms of the American um, reputation on this, our credibility again goes down. Um, the press will cover this, it should cover this, and it is a terrible, disastrous story. There have been points made by various commentators about how, how we can send our troopers back in on a limited basis and save those people. That's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. We are wrong way Corrigan on this, and that decision was and is bad, and we will regret it. Yeah, I, I have to agree. In fact, the collapse to um, on Cabal um, is almost faster than it was back in the Vietnam War when Saigon was overrun by the North Vietnamese. Uh, I just hope we don't have visuals of helicopters taking off from rooftops. And um, those images never left my memory, and I'm sure millions of other Americans Wait, and, wait till you see the images of, of uh, the uh, uh, Taliban beheading people in the street. The, uh, the interrogators that, up. not the interrogators, the interpreters that worked with the American troops and their contractors. Yeah, I, I don't know how they get out of the country at this point because they're being, all these uh, capitals are being overrun within the provinces. So you're right, Jay. It's a topic for a next show, perhaps. So um, I want to thank you, Jay, for joining us. It's like old times. I mean, miss uh, Stephanie Dalton. I miss Cynthia Lee Sinclair. We miss Winston Welch, but we'll get him back on the show soon. So thank you, Jay. Appreciate your time. Join us next week, Wednesday, 11 o'clock for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we'll see you then. Aloha.